morning, all of you. So this is the ninth series in the Global Lecture Series of Biotech Research Society. So uh, today we have with, uh, with us Professor uh, Samir Khanna from Professor of Environmental uh, Engineering, University of Hawaii at Manoa. So uh, before I give a short introduction about the, uh, Professor Samir, I welcome all of you in this uh, global access series of uh, BRSI. Uh, professor Samir Khanal is a professor of environmental engineering, Department of Molecular Bioscience and Bioengineering, University of Hawaii at Manawa. Professor Khanal started his tenure track faculty position in 20, between 2008 at the University of Hawaii. For joining UHM, he was a postdoctoral research associate for two years and then research assistant professor for four years in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at Iowa State University. He received BS honors in civil engineering from Malaysia, Malavia National Institute of Technology, Jaipur, India, and MS in environmental engineering from Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, Thailand. His PhD degree is in environmental engineering from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Hong Kong. Professor Kanal is a globally recognized researcher in the field of anaerobic digestion, nanobubble technology, aquaponics, and waste resources. He has over 140 referred publications in top rated international journals, 17 book chapters, and 10 books, including one best selling book on anaerobic biotechnology for bioenergy production, principles, and application. And uh, he also wrote one textbook, Bioenergy Principles and Application. Professor Kanal is one of the most productive researchers with the Scopus H index of 49 and Google Scholar H index of 57. As evidenced from his achievements and research impact, Professor Kanal was awarded the highly prestigious Board of Regents Medal for Excellence in Research by the University of Hawaii, Elsevier's Impactful Research Award in 2018, and CTAHR Dean's Award of Excellence in Research by College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, University of Hawaii, Atimano. Professor Kanal was also awarded the Pandey Research Excellence Award of International Bioprocessing Association and Outstanding Alumni Award 2021 by Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, the Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Technology. Professor Kanal was also ranked the world's top two scientists by Stanford University study. He's an editor of Bioresource Technology and serves on the editorial board of uh, four other journals. He has also served as a leading guest editor of several special issues related to anaerobic digestion and waste to resources for bioresource technology. He has served on various committees of other professional uh, societies, including IWA AD 1917, World Congress, International Bioprocessing Association, and Professor Kanal is a professional engineer in the state of Iowa. So with this, I request Professor Kanal for his uh, talk on nanobubble technology in environmental remediation and food production. Professor Kanal. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, and good, good evening to all of you. And thank you, Binod, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Professor Asok Pandey, for the opportunity to present in this special global lecture series of the BRSI. So I'm very delighted uh, to share uh, one of the uh, research work that I have been working on. And, and this work is about how can we apply nanobubble technology in environmental remediation and food production. And I'm going to start now. Before I go, uh, let me share about uh, Hawaii. So Hawaii is uh, an island in the Pacific Ocean. This is also uh, one of the islands which is about uh, 3,200 or 3,400 kilometer far from any of the landmass. The closest one is uh, actually California. And this is also one of the states in the tropics. And this, this falls in the archipelago. 
And if you look at Hawaii itself, it consists of uh, different islands, as you can see, uh, these are different eight islands. And our university is located at Oahu, Honolulu, which is uh, this island. The formation of island actually started from, if you look at Northwest. So this was formed in the very first, then it's just keep moving to the east and then Oahu. And then the newest island is actually big island or island of Hawaii which is the biggest island among all. And the total population of Hawaii is somewhere around 1.2 or 1.3 million. And about 80% uh, of this population actually live in the uh, Oahu Island, which is in Honolulu. And Hawaii, as you know, is quite uh, known for beautiful beaches. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, the bird view of one of the very important uh, area where this was formed by the volcanic eruption. This is also a conservation area, and this is very really good for snorkeling to see different type of fish and different type of aquatic species here. And what I do usually is actually I hike every weekend and send my picture to Asok. So I go this mountain here, climb up and come down and go this way all the way up, and then go down this way and then down here. So about one and a half hour or two hour of my hiking daily. So that is my route. Uh, how I do all my weekend uh, actually activity here. And this is what's showing here. This is the island. Uh, uh, the, this is actually the Hanamoa Bay area, uh, but quite, quite popular for tourist attraction. And in interest, I of course uh, do research, but also I teach uh, uh, very tough courses, transport phenomena uh, for undergraduate. I do hiking and then some also, I do some research that related to uh, food production, especially aquaponic, bioponic, hydroponic. And then I also play racquetball. Uh, I was intramural champion when I was at Iowa State. So with this one, let's move to today's topic. So why nanobubble technology? Why this is so important technology? Why this is emerging so rapidly? If you look at any of the biological processes, especially uh, biological wastewater treatment processes, we have to supply air. So air is actually uh, not very soluble in the aqueous phase. So therefore, to remove any organic matter or nutrient or, or hydrolysis, we have to supply a lot of air into the aeration tank. And this is a very energy intensive processes. If you look at the, the cost of the energy consumption, this could be as high as 75% of the total operating cost alone will actually uh, require for the aeration. And those, in aeration processes, we use either mechanical aerators or diffuser, and it requires electrical energy. And the oxygen transfer efficiency of those devices are pretty low. Maximum, it could be 10%. So essentially, we have to spend a lot of energy for supplying enough oxygen for the microbial community to degrade the organic matter or to remove, to remove the nutrients. So this is one of the limitation of the air supplying as a big bubble or macro bubble. So from there, that is for the wastewater treatment or waste remediation side. If we look at the agriculture perspective, low diesel of oxygen also has a lot of other effect, especially it induces stress on the plant, especially it causes root rot disease. It may plant may have a poor nutrient utilization efficiency. And as a result, it may have a low yield of the plant. And if you look at the intensive agriculture application, the root zone may become anoxic quite quickly because the large bubble will escape very rapidly. So there may be limitation of oxygen in the root zone. So from that perspective, supplying oxygen in a more much efficient way is one of the area of improving environment and also improving the food production. This is only the part, but nanobubble technology has other applications, which I'm going to share you in, a, in the coming slides. So if you look at the nanobubble itself, uh, this is one of the technology for supplying gas in the liquid phase. Some of the gases which are poorly soluble in the liquid phase. And in that cases, we can also use this nanobubble technology for any of the bioprocessing, producing different enzymes, producing different metabolites that require a lot of oxygen protein, uh, producing single cell protein. They require a lot of oxygen and we are not able to supply enough oxygen for the microbial group. In that case, uh, this nanobubble technology could play a very important role. It could also be a very important way of supplying carbon dioxide, nanobubble carbon dioxide 
for microalgae or macroalgae production, which I'm going to share you as well in the later slides. So if you look at the, some of the processes, aerobic processes, how intense the mixing has to be to supply enough oxygen. And this intense mixing sometimes uh, destroy the flock structure, destroy the biomass structure, and make it very difficult for the biomass to settle down. At the same time, it may also have some inhibitory effect and so forth. So from that perspective, supplying enough oxygen without intense mixing is one of the benefit of nanobubble technology. Now, looking at some of the applications with respect to the nanobubble, bubbles, you can see here, air nanobubble, uh, the supply nanobubble in, from the air, it can enhance the crop yield, especially agriculture. It can also be used in aquaculture, aquaponic, bioponic, hydroponic, and aeroponic studies as well. And this nanobubble can also be used for dissolved air flotation to remove some of the particles that do not settle very well. Oxygen nanobubble, sometimes we can use pure oxygen nanobubble because that can enhance the biomass significantly. And in, also we can use in some of the biological wastewater treatment processes, removal of different type of uh, antibiotics and, and other type of contaminant, including nutrient. We can also supply uh, nanobubble, uh, ozone nanobubble, nanobubble in the form of ozone. So ozone is also very important chemicals used in many industrial applications. This ozone can be supplied as a nanobubble, then it may have a better uh, oxidation of the recalcitrant organic matter, different type of organic matter that are not easily degradable in the biological system. Their processes is called advanced oxidation processes, AOP processes. Ozone nanobubble can, be, can also be used for microbial uh, decontamination, deactivation or disinfection. And this is, has a significant implication in water reuse and water reclamation. So we can actually supply a small amount of ozone at the same time, it may become much effective because of efficient mass transfer. And we can also supply CO2, carbon dioxide in the form of nanobubble, a small bubble, and that will provide a better ox uh, CO2 dissolution in the aqueous phase, and then allowing for the micro and macro algae to grow more rapidly, which has significant implication in producing different type of metabolites also for aquatic feed and, and other type of feed application. And this could also be one way of carbon sequestration. It can actually sequester carbon much effectively if we supply in the form of nanobubble. We can also supply hydrogen, which is also one of the gas that is not very soluble in the liquid phase uh, that could be used for enhancing hydrotropic methanogenesis, which is one of the processes to produce methane gas. And that can also be used for biogas uh, upgrading application. We can also supply hydrogen in the form of nanobubble for autotrophic denitrification. That means removing nitrate from the wastewater by without using any carbon source. And we can also supply nanobubble in form of carbon monoxide that is used for syngas fermentation to produce ethanol or organic acids. And last but not the least, methane is also not highly soluble in the liquid phase. We can also supply uh, nanobubble in the form of methane nanobubble which would enhance the activity of what are called methanotrophs, the group of microorganisms that uses methane as a source of carbon, as a source of energy. And those microorganisms can convert methane into single cell protein, bioplastics, methanol, ectoin, fatty acid, lipid, and organic acid, and so forth. So from that perspective, we can see that there's a lot of application of supplying any of those gases in the form of nanobubble. Now, if you look at the publication before 2016, the term nanobubble was not clearly, clearly defined. They use any bubble, gas fill bubble with a size less than one micrometer or one nanometer were collectively known as nanobubble. Then to make it more universal definition, in 2017, they formed a society called Fine Bubble Industry Association. And they set up a new ISO standard to uniformly define the nanobubble. Now they somehow replace the term nanobubble with ultrafine bubble. So ultrafine bubble essentially supersedes any of the previous definition of nanobubble. Still many people term those small bubble as a nanobubble. Now, what really is nanobubble then? So nanobubbles are the tiny gaseous cavities uh, with, within the aqueous solution. 
which has the diameter of about 15 to 50 to 200 nanometer size. So the average diameter could vary somewhere from 50 nanometer to 200 nanometer size. And they are formed by different methods. I'm going to talk to you in detail later. And uh, the most commonly used method of what we call the pressurized dissolution, or sometimes we call hydrodynamic cavitation. So this is one of the hydraulic phenomena in which we form a hydraulic uh, cavitation and that will actually atomizes this uh, liquid molecule in which we supply gas at a high pressure and it forms the nanobubble. We also develop some of the um, ceramic membrane processes. So they are some of the membrane processes they have a pore size, smaller, and we apply pressure so that those bubbles that comes out from this pore are also in nanobubble range. So these are some of the techniques by which this nanobubble can be generated. Now, nanobubble, in fact, was there for a long, long time, but there was no any acceptance because there was no way to define, to measure, to identify the nanobubble. So therefore, it only after 2000, uh, the first image of the nanobubble appeared, and there was measured by atomic force microscopy, which were able to identify this nanobubble. And since 2000, you can see a lot of publication started to come up in the field of this nanobubble technology for different applications, including food, feed, environmental remediation, or medical field, and also many other applications part. So what are the unique properties of some of the unique attributes of nanobubble? So it has a negative surface charge. So nanobubble essentially acts as a colloidal particle in somehow. So the surface of those particles are negatively charged. And also it has a high negative zeta potential, which I'm going to tell you a little bit detail about what the zeta potential stands for. And also because of the smaller size, it provides a better opportunity for mass transfer in the liquid phase and it has a long retention time in the solution because of the smaller size. So nanobubble essentially is a colloidal particle because of the negative charge, it will essentially attract any of the cation on the surface that you see here. And therefore, the, this is the uh, surface charge. So any of the cation that is on the surrounding will be attracted towards those uh, negative charge particles. So if you look at the mass transfer basic principle, this is essentially based on the true film theory. So that means any liquid, any gas in the liquid phase will be at a higher concentration. And then this gas molecule to go into the liquid phase, it has to overcome a number of different resistance. And those resistance include the gas film resistance is here, first thing, the gas it has to overcome. So once it's overcome gas resistance, it will enter into the phase boundary, then after phase boundary, it crosses into the liquid flame and there is also resistance. So these are the resistance as such for this gas molecule to pass into liquid phase. So after overcoming this resistance, the solubility of this gas molecule in the liquid phase is CAL. Now, how much of this gas will be dissolved in the liquid phase depends on number of factors depends, one of the important factors is the size of the gas bubble. The smaller the size, larger surface area, and thus it has a better mass transfer efficiency. Temperature, different type of uh, the, the salinity and mixing. There are so many other factors come into the picture, but one of the most important factor is the interface, the surface area of the bubble. So in that, if you look at the size of the bubble, the macro bubble, which is commonly used in many of the conventional diffuser, they are much larger size of this bubble. And oxygen molecule, they will carry oxygen molecule or hydrogen molecule or any other type of molecule here. And because of the bigger size, it can only hold a certain amount of this bubble, as you can see from this one. Now, if you divide the same bubble into 100 bubble or 1,000 bubble, then what you can see, the same bubble can carry so much oxygen molecule on the surface. And that is what exactly happening in nanobubble. So when the bubble becomes smaller, it has much larger surface area and it can carry much more oxygen, hydrogen, methane, CO2, whatever gas molecule that you want to dissolve. And this is the, how the nanobubble actually works. And from that, 
Now this is smaller molecule that carry air, oxygen, CO2, the gas molecule, and that gas molecule now transfer onto the surface of the microbial cell or any type of enzyme or any type of surface. And that's how the microbes will have enough unlimiting amount of this gaseous molecule for this biochemical reaction to go in a much faster rate. So that is the whole premise of this nanobubble technology. Now, we did some experiment to look at what is the mass transfer rate of this nanobubble in compared to the bubble coming from the conventional diffuser. So here, if you look at the conventional diffuser, which is commonly used in many wastewater treatment process or bioprocessing, your KLA rate, which is mass transfer rate, is about 1.731 part here. Now, if you look at the nanobubble supplying this air in the form of nanobubble, then your rate become almost three to four times higher. So you have much faster transport of gas molecule in the liquid phase. So that is one of the benefit of the nanobubble. Similarly, if you look at the nanobubble saturation concentration, uh, this the top part is the concentration of the nanobubble, super saturated. You can see the concentration may go up to 12 or 10, which is not possible if you just use air. Air has a maximum solubility of somewhere maybe eight, not more than 8.5 milligram per liter of the normal condition. A nanobubble can go 120 or 110% saturation. So you can still maintain much higher dissolved oxygen concentration in the aqueous phase compared to the combination diffuser. So you have a higher uh, solubility of those gases in the liquid phase. Now, some of the basic uh, properties of nanobubble, as I mentioned to you, is that they have a surface charge. So these surface stars give what call the phenomena of zeta potential. So zeta potential is essentially electrical potential at the interface of the double layer. And what this zeta potential tells us that the higher the zeta potential of any particle, the particles are more stable in the liquid phase. That means this particle will never come together and collapse together. They will stay away from each other. So this higher zeta potential, negative zeta potential means this particle are much higher stability. So they don't come together, they don't collapse together, and they don't form bigger particles. They will stay away from each other because of the negative charge. And this is very common colloidal phenomena. And because of the high stability, and also because of the electrostatic injection, their property can be harnessed in many applications, including defalling. That means preventing the falling in many of the membrane surfaces, flotation, and also it can help to enhance the mass transfer of cations, such as ammonium or calcium, magnesium, which are positive ions that can be easily transferred by using this nanobubble technology. So these are some of the properties. Now in the flood flotation, which is quite commonly used in many industrial wastewater treatment to remove any of the material, which cannot be easily settled down in the system under gravity. In such cases, by supplying nanobubble in pressurized form in the, in the aqueous phase, it will carry, it will uh, essentially coat the pollutant and that will float on the surface and you remove them by skimming. So that is one of the advantages. And this is commonly used for many of the industrial processes to remove oily substances or any type of greasy substances. That could also be one benefit of using nanobubble. Now, we did some experiment to look at uh, what is the effect of pH on zeta potential and the concentration of nanobubble in the aqueous phase. So if you look at the pH, we vary the pH of the liquid phase, the concentration of the bubble in the liquid phase remained very stable. It did not have any, any change with the pH. So pH didn't have so any effect on the nanobubble concentration. That means concentration of nanobubble in the liquid phase. It remains somewhere between 100 to one, uh, 150 to 200, somewhere 100, 150 uh, million bubbles, nanobubbles per ml. At the same time, the zeta potential essentially increase with the pH, which is a very common phenomenon. We also look at the size of the bubble, bubble size with the pH. So as you can see there, even we change the, P, the pH the bubble concentration of the nanobubble remain constant in, in the range of somewhere 100 or 110 nanometer, whereas the zeta potential increase with the pH. So you can see that 
the PS did not seem to have any effect on both size and concentration of nanobubble. We also look at the zeta potential when they become stabilized. So if you look at this one, the zeta potential essentially stabilized somewhere in the 27 millivolts. So you can see that zeta potential remain within 10 minutes. Within 10 minutes, zeta potential remain very stable. Within 40 minutes, it become very stable about minus 27 millivolts. So very stable zeta potential of the solution when you supply nanobubble. You also look at the size of the nanobubble in the system. So within 10 minutes of the aeration with the nanobubble, you can see that the size remain very stable about 120 nanometer within 10 minutes. So that means they did not change with time. After 10 minutes of nanobubble supplying in the aqueous space, uh, the concentration, the size remain fairly stable. Now we also look at the particle size when the particle size reaches maximum. So if you look at the timing here, this is the concentration of nanobubble in the aqueous phase. And this is the supplying of nanobubble. And if you keep supplying nanobubble, they'll increase. But after 50 minutes, uh, they remain pretty standard. They did not actually increase further. So you can see there from here, uh, in one ml of the liquid, you will get about 200 30 million of the nanobubble in the liquid phase. So that is actually actually what we we get. So when you supply nanobubble, we have to understand that you are you are getting particle of different size. So we are only measuring those concentrations that falls within the nanobubble range, and that is about 230 to 240 million per ml within 50 minutes. So that is some of the uh, basic basic properties of the nanobubble. Now we also look at the CO2 concentration. We supply CO2, carbon dioxide uh, into the liquid phase. And actually we have the machine or instrument that measures the concentration of nanobubble and that is called nanosite NS300. So this machine will essentially detect the concentration and also the size of the nanobubble in the aqueous phase. So we use milliwater of pure water and the supply the CO2 in the nano, nano, yeah. nanobubble form. And then we measure the sample, the size. So if you look at this one, in this case, uh, there is essentially in the different concentration rate, zero to 50, 51 to 100, 101 to 150. And this is the range, the size of the nanobubble, CO2 nanobubble, and that is the concentration. If you look at this one, the major part of the nanobubble are within, you can see here, 100 to 200 nanometer size. There's a lot of variation here which are essentially some different noises, but this is the highest concentration we can achieve. And the, the, their, their size are in between 100 to 200 nanometer, which is much smaller than the conventional CO2 that we supply into the liquid space. Now question comes in this uh, CO2, what effect does the CO2 in the form of nanobubble will have compared to CO2 as the macro bubble? That is some of the very fundamental things that we need to look at because we don't exactly, we are supplying nanobubble in a very small form. Does the small form of nanobubble will have some other physiochemical effect on the microalgae cell? We don't know yet. We are investigating from those. We require a lot of uh, basic understanding of the molecular phenomena and from the cell, cell biology phenomena. So that part is not discussed here, but I'm just giving you the concentration that we observed in these particular studies. Now, other important property of nanobubble is nanobubble are formed because of the cavitation, <clears throat> which is very similar to what happened in sonication and so forth. So in the formation of nanobubble, it also actually produces a different type of what you call reactive oxygen species, ROS, that includes hydroxyl radical, superoxide, singlet oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, and so forth. And these are highly oxidizing, actually, um, chemicals, chemicals that are produced in the formation, during the formation of nanobubble. And when the nanobubble essentially collapses, it releases significant amount of energy and that energy essentially helps to break down the water and, and lead to the formation of these hydroxyl radical. And this hydroxyl radical <coughs> has a significant uh, benefit in terms of removing some of the decalcitrant organic matter, color removal, pathogen deactivation, and also maybe removal of antibiotics and other type of pharmaceutical compound. And one study has shown that if we supply a nanobubble for seed germination, it actually enhances 
a much higher seed germination rate compared to using simple water. So there's some benefit of using this nanobubble for seed germination for many of the high value products. So that could be other benefit, how the nanobubble can be used for agriculture applications, especially for high value agriculture. So this is some of the basic phenomena, how the R is formed. Essentially, because of the collapse of the nanobubble that will be significant amount of energy, and that energy will break down the water and producing both hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion. And this is essentially how they form. And that formation could also have some effect on microbial community and other type of pollutants. So now how they are formed, as I mentioned, uh, they are formed by two basic phenomena. One, what we call the hydrodynamic cavitation. So you essentially allow liquid to pass through what you call Venturi tube, which is one of the very important uh, hydraulic device. And you supply pressurized ga uh, uh, gas, could be CO2, could be hydrogen, could be oxygen, could be methane in this form. And then they will mix together. And as you release the pressure suddenly, the sudden release in pressure somehow decompresses and then breaking down this water into a, you know, atomic form. And that re release the formation of nanobubble. And that is essentially what happens here. So sudden decompression essentially atomizes these water and the gas and lead to the formation of nanobubble. And that is one of the phenomena how the nanobubble are produced in the aqueous space. But also we have been, uh, we have developed some technique. Uh, we bought some membrane, that membrane has a smaller pore size and then we put them in a specific casing and apply the pressure that also lead to the formation of the nanobubble. So that is essentially using ceramic membrane as a technique to produce nanobubble, but you require, you must have much higher pressure talking about 30 to 40 PSI pressure, which is uh, much, much higher. So this is one of the uh, example that we produce nanobubble. As you see here, and this is a device, how they produce nanobubble in the liquid phase here, and then the nanobubble the form are collected in the tank. So they look a little bit cloudy because of different particle size, uh, the nanobubble size, but they are essentially the uh, milky look. So most of those are very milky look because of the different particle size and the nanobubble size. That's how the nanobubble are generated here. They have compressor and then they have cavitation. There is a chamber for cavitation and going through the bucket. And that's how we collect the nanobubble. Now, if you look at the application of nanobubble, there are different applications. I'm not going to go in detail, but that could be applied for aquaponic, hydroponic, bioponic applications. It can be used for seed germination. It can also be used for remove some of the contaminant from the sediment side by using nanobubble. It can be used for, for flotation. It can be used also for water declamation, water reuse. It can also be used for anaerobic digestion for enhancing uh, the hydrolysis. Uh, it can also be used for biogas upgrading by improving the hydrogen tropic methanogenesis. It can also be used for sulfide uh, oxidation. It can be used for uh, in, in algae production, micro or macro algae production by improving the mass transfer of CO2. It can also be used in the, uh, in the aerobic heterotropic fermentation of putting some of the algae that are growing heterotropically. It can be used for membrane defalling and can be used for degradation of different type of organic pollutant uh, here and so forth. So there are different applications of nanobubble. I'm not touching on the side of the medical field because that is beyond my scope, but I'm talking about agriculture and the environmental remediation side. In our studies, we use this nanobubble technology for growing the edible crops, especially uh, different type of plants that is used for vegetable and also for fish cultivation. So here, we use this nanobubble technology here, supplying nanobubble to the fish tank and also for the plant to grow. And just to see what the effect nanobubble has on the fish as well as on the plants. So I'm going to go and share some of the work that we have done here, not in detail, but just to give you some of the ideas. So if you look at the aquaculture itself, uh, it is a biological processes. So we supply fish feed, which is very rich in protein, about 60% or 70% protein. So they consume the fish meal and then produces ammonia from two pathways. One is uh, through the kidney and the religious free ammonia here. And this ammonia, ammonium will be oxidized uh, into uh, nitrite and then to nitrate. So this is essentially require oxygen. So oxygen has to be supplied 
to convert ammonia, ammonium into nitrite by the ammonia oxidizing bacteria. And then the nitrite are converted into nitrate again, taking oxygen. This process is called nitrification. And the nitrate oxidizing bacteria will convert into nitrate. From nitrate, what we do, if there's not enough oxygen, the nitrate will be reduced to nitrogen gas. This process is called denitrification and we lost nitrate. But if we have a better higher nitrate and high DO, the nitrate can be recycled for growing the plants or vegetables. So that is the source of nutrient. At the same time, it also releases fishy or solid waste material that also contain different type of protein. The complex material will be decomposed because of oxygen coming from nanobubble or other type of aeration processes and breaking down this complex organic matter into a soluble compound, different type of micronutrient and so forth, and then producing nutrient for the plant. So this is the pathway by which we produce nutrient in the aquaculture system. So in all system, oxygen play a very important role. If there is not enough oxygen, we built up nitrite or we built up ammonia. And those are toxic to the fish and thus your fish yield will decrease. At the same time, you may also lose a lot of nitrate in the form of nitrous oxide or nitrogen. And those are also greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. So there are a lot of consequences of nitrogen pollution in aquaculture application. So in our study, we look at how can we improve the ammonia and nitrification to convert nitrate and recover higher nitrate for plant growth. At the same time, providing a better water quality for the fish. So this is the system that we operated. We have the nanobubble generator on the side. We have fish tank here, and then we have the grow bed where the plants are grow. These are the edible lettuce that we actually grow in the system. And we also measure some of the basic parameters such as the zeta potential and the particle size of the nanobubble, which is about 150 or 200 to 150 nanometer, which is much, much smaller than the conventional bubble. Now, these are essentially gives you the measurement of the nanobubble size. If you look at here, measure part of the nanobubble's concentration. This is the concentration here and the size. So measure size are less than you can see 100 nano, nanometer size. Similarly, here also other side, in the five trials, you can see the size are always less than, you know, in the range of 100, less than 100 nanometer size. So a smaller size nanobubble and overly less than 100 nanometer, nanometer size. And the concentration could, if you see here, concentration would be 150, there were 500 uh, million particles per ml. So these are the nanobubble concentration in the aqueous phase that we measure. Now, if you look at the fish eel in this trial, we found that when you supply nanobubble, we actually get about 15 to 16 percent higher the biomass eel from the fish compared to the conventional aeration part. So that means we get a better fish eel because of the better water quality and better oxygen in the system. So that is one of the benefits of supplying nanobubble in the fish. But if we have shrimp, shrimp is very interesting. In the same, what happened that there's a lot of algae growth. Daytime, there's enough oxygen because of the algae supply oxygen. But at the nighttime, what happened that the photosynthesis pathway stops and then the benthic layer of many of the shrimp live in the benthic layer, the oxygen become much lower. So nighttime, they have oxygen deficiency and that oxygen deficiency causes stress on the stream and stream yield will actually significantly decrease. So therefore, by having a nanobubble generator in the on the same tank at the night time will somehow will give a benefit of improving the air in the system and then improve the yield. At the daytime we don't need because that time there's the algae growth and they do supply oxygen. So that is one of the things actually one of the projects we are looking at uh, in Vietnam now just to see how the nanobubble effect on the same cultivation within the night time. Now if you look at the plant growth side which is very interesting so this is the control. That means these are supplied with the conventional aeration, conventional diffusion. This is the lettuce, which is commonly used for the salad here. And then these are grown into grow bed. So there's water, nutrient-rich water is flowing continuously. And on your right, left side, you can see here, this is the control, which is without nanobubble generator, supply nanobubble. And on the right side, these are the lettuce which are subjected to nanobubbles. So nanobubble water was continuously pumped through the system. 
So in nanobubble supplying system, uh, we can see that the root growth was significantly higher. You don't see any root growth. These are run parallelly on the same conditions. So you don't see any root growth much higher here. But in the case of nanobubble generator, we can see such a better eat uh, root growth because it provides much higher diesel oxygen and much higher nutrient and thus facilitating, facilitating the better growth of the plant. And we also look at the, the, the head of the lettuce. If you look at on the right side, here, right side, these are the, uh, the conventional diffuser, the normal diffuser. You can see they look in a much bigger size, but actually the head is not compact. That are very floppy head. But if you look at the nanobubble supplied letters, these heads are highly compact, very high dense. So even the size is smaller, it has much higher weight. So overall, we found that with nanobubble, 40 to 50 percent higher. So you have almost two times higher yield compared to the normal aeration. So that all comes from the benefit of supplying enough nanobubble in the system. So if you look at the yield itself, uh, interestingly, uh, within 30 days, total period of one, one, one cycle is about maybe 50 days and so forth. So within first 30 days, nothing significant happened. Plant is growing slowly. So once the plant started to grow rapidly, it takes up oxygen very rapidly. So it requires a lot of oxygen, a lot of nutrient. In that case, you can see the plant growth takes place so significantly higher after day 30. And then you can see the it grows surpasses significantly than the control one, which is the uh, the this part, the the blue one. The blue one is the nanobubble supply plant, and the green one is the conventional aeration diffuser. You can see the significant difference. Even these are three replications done in three different regions. Continuously, we have been seeing a higher yield of this plant compared to the normal aeration. So from that perspective, you can see that nanobubble will provide you two times higher yield compared to the normal aeration. So that is one of the benefits of nanobubble. We also look at how the nanobubble affect microalgae growth. So this is one of the studies that we did a few times. So here we use Clamo uh, modernus, one of the uh, LG, and we use controlled no nanobubble aeration. And then we also use uh, CO2, nanobubble CO2, and this is nanobubble C without nanobubble CO2 and with nanobubble CO2, about 50%. So you can see that from this study, with nanobubble supplying carbon dioxide, it actually gives you much higher yield, as you can see from the dark green color compared to the control. And in terms of yield, we can see that with higher nanobubble, we can see at least 1.3 to 1.4 times higher yield compared to the control. So that means having a nanobubble supply as a CO2 has a much higher yield for macroalgae. And then could also be applied for macroalgae as well. So by using nanobubble, we can actually enhance the growth of the macroalgae. So that's one of the studies we have been now continuously working on and developing and refining these processes. So overall, I want to summarize that nanobubble is a promising uh, technology and it can supersaturate any of those gases uh, which, are not poor, which are very poorly soluble in the liquid phase. And especially if you want to look at the plant growth, uh, especially aquaponic, hydroponic, bioponic, we can get almost two times higher yield because of the better nitrification and nitrogen transformation. So it has also potential for different application, including organic degradation, wastewater treatment, aquaculture, aquaponic, micro and macroalgae uh, production, enhancing methanogenic activity uh, and methanotropic activity. So these are the, some of the benefits that we can get by using nanobubble technology. Still, uh, there are a lot of research need to be done including understanding most of the fundamental mechanistic understanding how this nanobubble affects is just because of the higher solubility or because of some other molecular mechanism that has not been well examined yet that need to be studied. And also a more in-depth study are needed to apply this technology in a pilot scale and a larger scale. And of course, we also have to do the techno-economic analysis, how costly or how cost effective those are compared to conventional technology. So these are the, some of the things that need to be conducted, but it is something that is actually coming up. It may somehow change the way we use the nanobubble. So nanobubble 
with a million benefits is the main uh, theme of this project. It was funded by the USDA NEPA program, Sun Grant, and also from the Team Science Project. And then also uh, students work in the project are here, uh, Tai, Kyle, Lisa, and the student that they all had been working on this project. And with this one, I would like to thank uh, uh, the organizing committee for giving me a chance to share my work. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Yeah, I, yeah, I ask a small, small but curious question. Your nanobubbles and nanoparticles. What? How do you look at them? Nanoparticles and nanobubbles. Same thing. Yes, no, very good question. So you want to, your question is, how you differentiate between nanobubble and nanoparticle, right? Right, right. So now, yeah, now in very good question, in our machine that we call nanoside, is nanoside will only measure any particle which are nanosides. It doesn't differentiate between nanoparticle and nanobubble. So that's why when we do all the testing, we clean everything as perfectly as possible. Our rooms are highly clean room, and we try to avoid any of the particle coming in the system with the control, and that's how. But very good question. It doesn't differentiate between any nanoparticle. If there's any nanoparticle coming from any source, it will also be detected as a nanobubble. So it doesn't differentiate. So there is still not well-defined measurement technique for nanobubble and nanoparticle. Okay, thank you. That is the measurement uh, limitation of this particle. So it's a new technology. Yes, it is, it is coming up. It is coming up and a lot of works are going on in this direction. Samir, there is a question that uh... Uh, I'm curious to know if there is any preliminary comparative cost on nanobubble production in relation to conventional aeration. Good question. And uh, so far, based on my understanding and based on any of the literature that we have seen, uh, I haven't seen any comparative study, side-by-side -side study on cost factor and, and, and a comparison part that has not been done yet. So that is something need to be done. Uh, if you look at the cost of nanobubble generator that produced by Japan, one unit uh, will cost, the small unit will cost somewhere $30,000 per unit. Uh, the, the one we're developing membrane will cost only somewhere $200 or $300 per piece. So actually things are going more in the membrane direction than using the liquid phase. So it's certainly uh, not much work on the techno-economic analysis of the nanobubble technology yet. But I would say that looking at the, you know, because we all know that uh, if there is a, it is just not the aeration impact, it is uh, beyond that. And resulting any kind of bioprocess, whether it is wastewater treatment or any other kind of, uh, and depending upon the application, I, I think that there would be looking at the increase in efficiency or increase in productivity. For example, if it is a microalgal cultivation, the biomass productivity, increase in productivity in biomass, or for that matter, any bioprocess. I think uh, this could be very interesting. And as far as the cost of uh, nanobubble equipment is concerned, it's a matter of time only. The moment uh, this, uh, you know, there are more works and the technology, you know, uh, not technology, I would say when uh, more R&D is done, people come to know about that, then I think there could be good possibility to increase, uh, you know, people who may be interested to, uh, you know, develop this kind of equipment more and more. Very good point, Asok. Yeah, we, we are also looking at that, how the nanobubble will influence the formation of metabolite, not only yield, but accumulation of metabolite because of some other stressor factor that come into picture. Uh, that part is something that we are, eager to look at, especially DHA, EPA, and those kind of thing in, in the NGCL. Yeah. 
Uh, and not only that, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, reactor design, and then if you go any kind of bioprocess, the shear stress which is caused, uh, and also the, the pockets where anaerobic loops are, you know, developed in the wind, depending upon the viscosity of the medium. Then in all such cases, I think if there is a, a nano bubbling, this uh, negative, uh, perhaps, you know, kind of phenomena could be controlled much better. And then also there is another point that, uh, which you know that uh, also sometimes there is a contamination in bioprocesses and it is primarily because of the improper or lack of uh, oxygen dissolved into the water. So if nano uh, bubble are there, it might uh, be much more, you know, uh, perhaps effective in terms of dissolved oxygen. In fact, that you have already shown that there is increase in the, uh, you know, dissolved oxygen because of such uh, aeration. Yes, right. very good point of Sophia. Thank you. Uh, anybody else has any question? A brief point, you know. Yeah. Uh, firstly, I'm... Uh, Sorry, I could not join immediately uh, because of some technical issues. Uh, Samir, thank you so much for agreeing to give this lecture, wonderful lecture. And I'm really excited about your results on seed germination and on lettuce growth. Uh, I'm sure this technology would have great impact uh, when people are trying to do vegetable cultivation under greenhouse conditions. You know, there is a lot, lot more farmers which are adopting to those technologies. So together, coupled with that, if this nano bubble technology can be developed, which will be cost efficient, uh, yes. then uh, the yields probably can be uh, much better. Uh, also, of course, one will have to look at the quality uh, that is also sustained uh, during these uh, treatments. Uh, my One of the things was the seed germination. Uh, is anybody really looking into the mechanisms aspect of it, you know? Is it also the ROS production, which can act as a signaling uh, within the seeds, or there may be some other mechanisms altogether, which could be there. And second point, which I had in a, it's a very naive question, whether in the natural ecosystems, where these plants are growing, uh, you think uh, because of some other phenomena for the plants growing along with that, you might have production of these nanobubbles, in those natural ecosystems, which sustain their growth for a longer period of times. So although dissolved oxygen is there, but whether the uh, nano bubbles are produced in the natural systems. So these are two queries, you know, very random ones uh, which came to my mind. <laughs> well, a very good question. Thank you so much, Professor Sudhir Sapuri. Uh, I have not looked at the mechanism, how the nano bubble affects the seed growth but some Chinese group are looking at the, I think their focus is mostly on the ROS formation, the reactive oxygen species, uh, which they look at more carefully. And that is how helping the seed to cracks uh, because of the oxidation, uh, because of those radicals that has potential to break down the seed and have the EG oxidation. That is what I have seen, but I have not looked at the detailed mechanistic because it requires a lot of understanding of the plant physiology and plants at which I don't have expertise on their side to comment more. But certainly this is an important area. Now, as you mentioned, the nanobubble formation in the natural environment, and certainly yes, because when the river, uh, for example, when there is a flooding or there is other uh, situation, the liquid flow very fast in many of those uh, you know, around the pillar, around the boulder, or many other uh, areas. When there is a sudden change in the velocity of the liquid, it essentially releases a lot of energy uh, because of their, you know, the, the processes. The release of energy comes from this formation of eddies and vortices in, in the downstream processes. They also lead to the formation of these smaller particles. And, and that is also one of the phenomena we can see in the nature. Sometimes we call the hydraulic jump, sometimes we call the capitation. And that is uh, quite common in, in a stream when the water <clears throat> passes through the piers and other high velocity. So that is happening. But I'm not sure if plant produces any type of this nanoball by itself, that part, I cannot comment more. <laughs> I have no, ex no idea on that side. Thank you. Because I was interested, you know, sometimes we have many dormant seeds 
you know, which yes. do not germinate, whether this technology mm -hmm. could be helpful to break dormancy, which is a major issue in many of the plant species. So one, probably one could try uh, dormant seeds and see whether the dormancy can be broken by these uh, nanobubbles. Uh, yeah, they, they have been something. looking at, mm -hmm. yeah. Other interesting thing is microgreen technology, like, you know, the sprouting thing. So mm -hmm. there are also some people looking at the sprouting because now people are more interested in taking a sprout than taking a whole grain. Mm -hmm. So that's also one area where the nanobubble can help better sprouting and, and uh, better efficiency on that side. Great. Mm -hmm. On one hand, we are looking, PM yesterday, Prime Minister said that we go for nano fertilizers. On one yes, hand, yes. Uh, and uh, we are now yes, with nano bubbles. I think the two technologies yes. probably can really help uh, Indian agriculture in some uh, areas. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Actually, in other words, mm. it only means that you can go molecular. Mm. Molecules are nano. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, that's we're true. looking at molecules all nano. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think this one is interesting. Could be, could it be a quality of land, earth, that the quality of soil it is more porous. Maybe more nano bubbles are formed. It's very firm than nano bubbles may not be formed. So the soil quality may also contribute to natural formation of bubbles. Maybe this could be one thing to see. That's true. And, and I think when the organic matter is in the soil, sometimes it also becomes much easier and anaerobic and oxic. In that case, nanobubble also provide um, much better microaerobic conditions. So that also help to uh, better soil quality. We are more looking into hydroponics uh, culture systems uh, at present, you know. So these are basically yeah. Uh, your system is soilless uh, system. Soilless, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they call the climate smart uh, technology. Yeah, that climate yeah. smart technology yeah. now. That buzzword they call climate smart technology. gives you better yield in vegetables. <laughs> Sometimes it gives you better yield hydroponics. So uh, That's right. That's right. right. People yeah. are adopting and, to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and also you don't have too much issue with the insect and pest and other things. So it's better yeah. for the people. Yeah. Right. Anybody has any question? Otherwise, we'll uh, move to the next. Uh, Samir, we normally ask one question uh, to all the, I know, distinguished speaker under this series. This relates to a kind of general aspect. Uh, and uh, I take the privilege of uh, putting this question across to the speaker. This is regarding that. Uh, Taking from the, your childhood, going mm. for coming from Nepal, then coming to India, then going to Hong Kong, going to you know U.S. different universities. <laughs> Did you plan your future like this, or what was the motivating force you saw in yourself that you kept on you know, taking so much pain for? Did you think that you'll develop? Uh, like a scientist, as a great researcher, contributing globally this way. So, what way you 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 had uh, uh, you know thought of your future, and what kind of message from your own experience from Nepal to India to Hong Kong to US you would like to give to the people who are attending this session or those who are online listening on YouTube? Oh, sorry, this is a very Good question and very difficult question. Actually, even in my wildest dream, I didn't think that I will, you know, my goal, my main actually uh, dream was to become a science and math teacher back in Nepal because when I was in high school, there was shortage of math and science teacher. So uh, I wanted to become a science and math teacher. So that's why I went to study science and math. Somehow uh, I got really good marks. So they told, oh no, you have to become an engineer. And, okay, I will become an engineer. Then, uh, then I thought, which type of engineer will be good for Nepal? I said, oh, a lot of people are going to Rurki to study civil engineering, so I don't do study civil engineering. So that's how the, I got into civil engineering degree. And then, um, then I thought I, I have intuitive of doing, want to do a teacher, so I want to study PhD. So that's how uh, that PhD came into picture in my mind. Actually, uh, 
if you remember A.B. Gupta, Dr. Akhinda Gupta from MNIT, he also played a very important role in my uh, career advancement. He was a fresh graduate of IIT uh, Bombay. So he come up with a lot of new ideas and a lot of discussion with us. So my undergraduate uh, project was CFC and ozone layer depletion. If you look at 1980s, ozone was a big thing. And then he asked us to do a research on how the ozone layer affects the, uh, you know, CFC affects the ozone layer depletion. So at that time I read few ESNT paper when I was undergraduate, but I couldn't understand any of those ESNT paper because it was so fundamental. So, so that's how Yavi Gupta gave us some kind of a vision of research, getting into research field. And then, and then that's how I, I was interested in doing research, but my goal was not to stay in the US at all. I wanted to come here just for training and then return back to Asia and continue to work in the Asia, but somehow, I got entangled and then stay back in the US and continue. And along the path, many people, including you, helped me, support me, inspired me uh, to do a lot of work and research. And my main focus, actually my undergraduate was on structural engineering. I was doing a designing a bridge, designing a multi-story building, all the very, very, very mathematical term, but my interest from heart, I want to work in the environment. So I changed my field from structural engineering to environmental engineering. And because I, I like to work in the field of, you know, waste management, waste treatment and environmental thing. But certainly also I never thought that I will be teaching in the US and doing research. It all happened along the path. I would say just, uh, I would say my, my good luck or God's blessing or something happened. That's how I got into all these fields. So, uh, thanks, uh, Samir. I uh, I strongly believe it is not the luck; it is the hard work that uh, which uh, and the people like you make uh, own destiny. I am a believer of that, and the people sitting in front of Professor Sopori, Professor uh, Singh, they are the role models, you know, that uh, who have been doing day and night extraordinary in the work. So, and is role model for all of us. <laughs> Okay. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, as far as it's, it's so good that you remember that uh, Akhilendraji, Professor Akhilendra Gupta, that I wish he was uh, here in this, uh, you know, uh, with, in this meeting with us. And uh, he is one of the highly respected member of our society. Uh, just to let the members know that uh, so, uh, Samir is one of the, you know, person who supports uh, all kinds of RSI activities. And uh, since many years, uh, he has made it a point in his agenda, annual agenda, that he will every year attend a conference wherever it is held. It is also a very important uh, network partner between uh, BRSI and International Bioprocessing Association. He is a secretary there and uh, he, you know, so we are well, you know, linked together. And another important point is that, that uh, uh, in order to support uh, uh, the people of uh, the, the who attend Versailles conference, uh, Samir has a foundation in memory of his father, and uh, every year he sponsors uh, five awards to the best paper winners in uh, Versailles conference. So thank you, Samir, for your such a strong support, and we hope oh, that my pleasure. Uh, oh, this is very small. Also, how yeah. much my my father was a you, you may not know my father was Indian Army. Uh, work in the Assam Rifle. So from 1968, uh, 48 to 68. <laughs> yeah. So over to you, Professor, uh, for your uh, concluding remarks. Nothing much, I think. Uh, once again, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shamir, uh, for accepting our invitation to deliver this talk under global lecture series of BSRI. And uh, your support has always been there, as Shok was telling, and I'm sure this will continue to the organization in future also. And uh, hopefully I look forward. I've been to US uh, many times, visited many uh, states, but not to Hawaii yet. So hopefully next time uh, Please, everything is fine. Yeah. Uh, that's one place one would like to visit, you know, and especially Please. the <laughs> nice pictures which you have shown that <laughs> tempting that uh, we must visit Hawaii someday. Sure, so sure, look please. forward to keep in touch with you in future too. Uh, thank you so sure, much. Sure, sir. For, yeah, my pleasure. Uh, giving this talk. Uh, thank you so much. We know my pleasure. Yeah.
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Samir, for this uh, very, very informative talk. So we really appreciate your uh, uh, presence here and uh, your time here to spend here with us for giving you know, all this wonderful information to us. So thank you once again. The next lecture in this series will be on 23rd November 2022 by Professor Sunil Kaul, National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, Sukuba Jackpan. So he will, he will be talking on an overview of Ashwagandha, science and trust in Ayurveda. So uh, till then we meet for the next global lecture, lecture series. So I uh, once again thank uh, Professor uh, Sopori, Professor T.P. Singh and Professor Ashok Pandey and all other people who joined in this meeting in Zoom and as well as uh, those who are uh, attending this or uh, watching this meeting in YouTube live. Thank you all and meet you in the next lecture. Thanks, Samir. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. Very good morning.